Good afternoon and welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinars, our premier digital educational platform featuring a variety of interactive programs to provide you timely, engaging and essential education when and where your team needs it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director of Events here at NCIA, and as always, I'm very excited to welcome you all to another edition of our longest running program series, the Committee Insight Series, uh, today being presented by NCIA's Facility Design Committee. Before we get started, a final thank you and note to our guests joining us on the live stream on Facebook uh, as well. If you're an active NCIA member, follow that short link in our description to log into your account and join the conversation. If you're not an active NCAA member, follow the join now link to register and activate your membership today. All right, now let's get this show on the road. Today, our facility design committee has convened a panel of top level experts for an advanced session covering best practices to ensure design and commissioning parameters set you up for operational success. To kick things off, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's session, Brian Anderson, the partner at Anderson Porter Design to the virtual stage to introduce our packed panel of cannabis facility design experts. You can activate your video feed and take it away from here, Brian. Awesome. Um, I can't see myself. I hope you, oh, there we go. Um, fantastic. Very happy to be here. Thanks to all of our panelists, Brian and everybody at NCIA. Thank you. Um, I will start right in by introducing Tony Van Eyes. Um, Tony is our horticulture process, is a horticulture process engineer. Uh, Tony has 17 years now uh, in the cannabis industry, uh, 26 years in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. I know he has uh, work in automation. He's worked for Siemens in automation. Uh, Tony holds a master's in business administration. Uh, he works nationally. I think he's joining us from the West Coast. Tony's in Pacific time today. Um, and Tony is multilingual. I understand he speaks uh, both stoner and uh, on, and mechanical contractor. So um, awesome! Thank you for uh, thank you for joining us, Tony. And we all we are all members of the NCIA Facility Design Committee. We all relatively work together. So we're looking forward to a lively round robin conversation. So we'll continue that here by letting Tony introduce our next panelist. All right. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. So I'm going to introduce. Uh, Dario Boyce. He's originally from Barbados. He works with Anderson Porter Design. He has a, a master's in architecture and uh, certification as a project manager through the uh, Project Management Institute for three years. He worked in the architect field and cannabis industry now for five years. And uh, he's very good at making sure that the, the building has proper adjacency room to room and that uh, as we integrate changes throughout the design, uh, it flows very well within the building. Dario, Thank how are you doing? Thank you, Tony. I'm doing well. Um, I'm going to introduce David Dixon, who comes to us from um, a chemical engineer background, um, working in the pesticide in industry before transitioning to the food um, industry, the food processing industry, where he's worked for companies like Nestle. Um, he's then, since then, over the last 11 years, started his own business where he helps with the development of various processes with the last two years in the cannabis industry. You know, one thing about David, he likes to keep you on your toes uh, when it comes to food safety and, and processes. So, you know, he's a valued member of the team. Thank you, Dario. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, David V. David Valancourt is, is famous in our sector, he's everywhere. He's been in it for about five years, and before that, uh, a deep career in quality systems management and quality control. Uh, now working mostly for and with vertical integrated cannabis facilities. Um, he's developed a bit of an expertise helping clients troubleshoot some issues that come up, perhaps in compliance or regulatory, and basically get them organized so those issues don't come up. David, thank you. Take it away. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, David. Uh, other David. Um, good to be here. Um, so last but certainly not least, to bring it back, um, I want to introduce Brian Anderson. Uh, I give Brian credit for the reason why we're here. Um, he uh, is initially 
Um, he, he actually started and chaired the first year of the facility design committee here at NCIA. So he's now our emeritus chair. He comes out of Massachusetts, which is also my original hometown or my original home state, principal and co-founder of Anderson Porter Design. They've been around for over a quarter century, going on, I believe, their 27th year. So that gives Brian a little over 20 years of architect experience before getting into cannabis. Um, his firm now has uh, quite the kind of portfolio, about six, seven years in cannabis. They practice nationally in all aspects, and um, it's really exciting to be here. So uh, thanks, Brian, and I'll let you kind of take it from here. Awesome. Thank you, uh, David. So uh, I'll jump right into our takeaways. What I want, uh, you know, from an educational perspective, um, two real parts to our program here. And the first is around programming, um, also known as design qualifications, also known as owner's requirements. And so each of us are going to talk a little bit about that in our first segment uh, to give you, uh, our, our audience, a, a deep under, deeper understanding as to how that affects cannabis. Uh, and the second part of our program will be a deep dive into some use cases on how those, uh, how that preparation of programming, design criteria, and owner's requirements play out uh, in various aspects of, of facility design and operations. Um, so first, let me uh, kick it over to Dario. Dario, I know in architecture, the term is programming. Um, you know, give us, a, give us a sense of how, how programming plays a role architecturally in business success. You're on mute. Sorry, thank you, Brian. Um, so <laughs> for programming, so really programming is the process of gathering and analyzing and compiling information to make sure that the project runs smoothly. Um, because cannabis industries and businesses are so unique and have very specific requirements, um, it is important to go through this phase. Um, because we identify and talk to all the project stakeholders, we review and validate clients' goals and objectives, we gather data. So we look at your SOPs, your standard operating procedures, your narratives for cultivation, processing and manufacturing. And then we benchmark those against your equipment list and look at you know, project flow and processes flow. And then from all of this, we then we take that and we define what your performance will be, your performance design and operational criteria which we will then use to generate our test fits or the floor plan options that you have to choose from. We then you know, write up your requirement documentations. And then at, you know, from all of this, we then you know, can get to what you know, your commissioning expectations get. So you know, programming is very important when it comes to, to overall project success. Awesome, thank you. Tony, Dario mentioned a couple of, you know, terms like, you know, that relate to a business plan. You've got a master's in business, so KPIs and KPTs are key performance indicators and key performance targets. Those come right out of business planning. How do, how does that, how does that affect your world as a Hort process engineer? Sure. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. I think that one of the biggest challenges is, is in the programming phase, we try to balance you know, the revenue expectations of the organization uh, with the wants and needs with, let's say, if there's a grower on board and what he wants. Oftentimes we find that when we get through the programming phase, that the cost expectation, the budgets that the, the owners have are offset with the wants uh, of the grower and they don't always line up. And so the programming phase, we're able to balance those two things together and, and really make the proper adjustments so that we can uh, get to a facility design that is, is the best production facility we can put together. And, um... David Dixon, so I, I, I know from you that uh, design math occupies a big part of your world. How, is, how does that factor into your terminology and your use of these terms of around programming and design criteria? <clears throat> well, we build on uh, the programming from the architect, which is from room-based, and interject into that the process base. I'm basically an operations guy and a production guy. So it's all about um, cases per minute pallets per hour, pounds per minute, pounds per hour, on a machine, uh, strokes per minute, strokes per second, things like that. Understanding all that math helps you understand how materials are flowing through the building, how much uh, work in process you might need, et cetera. So it all starts with an Excel spreadsheet for me, and then it feeds into, thus, how big does that room need to be? Exactly. So, and then David Valancourt. So, you're our GMP specialist here. What, uh, you know, where does, 
where's your thinking on quality control relative to facility design, which is a capital expenditure versus versus quality control, which is often thought of as a operational and SOP sort of operational expenditure? Yeah, so it's a really good point. Um, a couple of things to, to think about. One is you know, back to the programming, right? And in the good manufacturing practices world, you'll commonly hear that referred to as like the user requirement specifications or URS. And that ties into the design qualifications. You know, that's all part of this programming phase. Um, <clears throat> making sure that that is well understood allows once you get into the operational phase, A, helps you build your, your procedures, right? What kinds of preventive controls, you know, in the, from the kind of food GMP world, they call them PCs or preventative control, preventive controls or GMPs, right? What programs do you need to ensure that you can meet certain criteria because there's always CapEx considerations and constraints. So maybe you can't put in, you know, a, a an air uh, a vestibule that has a certain air pressure difference um that might be you know there's uh, david dixon talks a lot when we work with him about good better best you know there's certain options and tiers and based on those what kind of controls do you need to have in place and then checkpoints to make sure that you're meeting them and again without any of this you can't qualify and you can't validate your equipment and your processes so starting at the very beginning a risk matrix that's one thing that we provide support with is you know assessing based on certain decisions that are made from floors and materials etc what um what controls you need to have in place once we get into the documentation and then the verification standpoints from operations so um it really you need to start at the beginning um we see this often where folks will you know want to get say gmp certified or some sort of quality system certification later but trying to dig through a lot of the programming documents um, that were done months ago and are, you know, have to get dusted off makes it a real challenge to, um, to really be able to build quality and kind of retrospectively, um, you know, really designing quality from the beginning is what we want to make sure is done. And it, it takes the whole team. That's why we've got this diverse panel here today. So I digress back to you, Brian. No. So you know, what's going on is I'm seeing that there's a lot of interaction here between as each of these various pieces gets brought forward, uh, ownership has, you know, support from a number of different perspectives, a horticulture perspective, a food safety perspective, from an operational management perspective, and from an architectural perspective. So, you know, let me kick it back over to Dario. What, you know, as you receive some of this information, both from the owner defining their criteria, owner's, owner's criteria, you know, how does that how does that, how do you build operational success architecturally? Uh, what are some of the things that as an architect you give back uh, and push back um, to keep this process moving? So, uh, you know, as I begin to lay out, you know, the floor plan, you know, the room spaces and allocations, the relationships between rooms, you know, and I looked at their equipment list, you know, if, for example, if packaging is so super important for them, you know, I'm going to try to put as much space that I can possibly can to package it. If for some reason that, you know, a particular piece of equipment can't fit, then I'm gonna, you know, bring it up to the top of the list. Hey, you know, you really want this piece of equipment, but it can't fit in the room. You know, I can potentially give you more space, maybe if you reduce the size of this room. So we often see this push and pull in programming where, you know, the client always wants to maximize, you know, for example, the cultivation space. Um, but then, you know, they want to do processing, they don't want to do extraction, they want to do, you know, mix, you know, all of those requires, you know, floor space. So, hey, you know, I'll then go back to someone like Tony, hey, the, the, the client wants to maximize, but I need space for this, you know, is a uh, single tier really the most beneficial um, bench to use? Or can we go to a double tier or a triple tier if the if we have the required ceiling heights? So it's really that push and pull that we have to go through with this whole program and um, process with all the stakeholders um, in the project. Yeah, Tony, I see you smiling. What uh, <laughs> I know there's some recent examples where, you know, that has to work with the owners with, the, you know, the owner has to be on board with this, right? So, you know, um, how do you manage that from a hort process in terms of, you know, what gets pushed, what gets pulled? How do you work that in from a business perspective, from a hort perspective? If if room, if we run out of room for, you know, for cultivation for uh, for mechanical equipment. Yeah, certainly. That's yeah. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we run into uh, when we're talking about. We have a question that popped up about retrofitting buildings 
and and we have some some case studies where you know we have a design criteria which sets the you know that we have a grower that comes in he wants a building to be designed in a particular way he has certain criteria temperatures outside air you know all of those factors that come into play and then we look at the building itself and we we find out that the building cannot from a capacity standpoint, meet the needs of the grower or the size of, of what the the owner wants from his revenue perspective. And so we, it's that balancing of how do we how do we properly provide a facility that has optimal productivity, but still meets the needs of the financial requirements on the capital side uh, versus the operating side for for fixed costs. So it's certainly a challenge, and we uh, oftentimes. In a case that we just had, uh, we couldn't hang uh, additional weight onto the roof because the roof didn't have the load uh, rating that it needed. And so then we had to shuffle and go from a single tier system to a two tier system to provide additional floor space for the mechanical systems. And so that really kind of can throw a, a, a chink in our plans. And we just have to be able to adjust and have open conversations with owners and growers about those needs and, and how we're going to have to make those changes as we as we move along. Well, that's it. You know, there's a theme I think we've all dealt with is, is, is ability to change and, have, and adapt to change. Uh, I know, David Dixon, you've probably never had a customer introduce a, a you know, a 483 phase fridge at the last minute, right, as a new item that had to be squeezed into a kitchen. What, uh, you know, or, or, or add a piece of equipment or say, hey, I really like to do a canning operation. Can we add a canning operation to this facility? Um, how do you manage those types of, uh, you know, how do we assure quality and yet manage an, 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 an ability to manage change? Well, in the example you mentioned, that's what contingency is for. Um, it happens all the time. You, know, you mean, I didn't tell you I was going to do ice cream uh, sort of question. <laughs> and right. so um, uh, part of it is to not shrink wrap the spaces. This happens a lot. Let's save money by taking two feet out of the building. Let's save money by taking the bay out. And then when the, I need to do ice cream or I need to do a, a, a different packaging entirely than I had anticipated, you're not stuck. So a little more robust in area at the programming stage and um, a little more uh, space around the equipment in the flo initial programming floor planning stage. Yeah, I, that's that is a, that is a, that is absolutely true. I know from an energy performance perspective, allowing mechanical electrical plumbing engineers a little bit of extra space in a mechanical room is a really important piece. I know the mechanical rooms uh, really weren't really on our topic here, but as you brought that up, I know that from a lot of experience, giving mechanical engineers and giving the mechanical installers a little bit of extra space to get to fit the ductwork in, to fit the boilers in, to fit the condensing. Uh, boilers in and the expansion tanks uh, can make uh, can make a lot of difference. So adding a little bit of extra space and anticipating change. David Valancourt, from a from a you know from a quality management, how do you how do you adapt or maintain quality while in the face of constant change? Yeah, um, you know that's definitely as you said. You know things uh, you know decisions are made later. I want I want ice cream. You know we want to produce ice cream, or oh we want to do lotions and salves, or you know tinctures. Well, we're going to put the bottling line right, and what controls need to be uh, in place. And so one of the kind of tying it back to the programming and just understanding and then building that that buffer in place for later changes um, is key. You know the the term is quality by design, and it's a lot easier to build in for the future for say five years, then have to say, oh, can we just move this post? Oh, is this load bearing? Oh, let's just, you know, it, you know, the, it, it becomes the point where you go and you say, let's just bulldoze and start over. So that it's a lot cheaper to bulldoze and start over sometimes than to have to do retrofits, which can be hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. Um, and that's really why the importance of all this upfront to tie it back to the quality question, you know, for example, we've seen a lot in the earlier days, we were seeing folks build, you know, these vertical integrations where they've got, you know, on the same hallway, uh, you know, open up, there's your bedroom and there's your packaging, processing, extraction room on the other side. Those are two different, completely different workflows, 
business units and departments. You know, uh, so as we've seen, as we've evolved, we've seen folks here build, if you're doing a greenhouse or, you know, in, in indoor grow, have that in a separate compartment. Make sure that employees walk in and go to the right, different changing rooms, because you're dealing with, you know, even if you're using cocoa core, it's a dirty operation. This is ag, right? There is bio burden in there. So have a separate process have an entirely separate flow and think of that as a different operation with different risks different controls different procedures than your post-harvest processing <clears throat> and making sure that that's designed from the get-go allows you to have your vertical but to make those considerations and then having that's where the quality unit comes in and makes those checks and balances to ensure that, no, that risk of cross-contamination because that's that's what you want to avoid and and brian if i can add to to david's point um understanding you know what the the client wants to do from a vertical standpoint allows us in programming to plan from this for, from the jump you know he brought a good point about you know planning for the future so if you know as a client you want to you know go into certain products in your kitchen down the road you know we can plan for that equipment now so that when that time comes around you already have the power there you have the water there you have all your utilities there the room is properly sized and you can just plug and play instead of you know being taken down certain rooms to renovate you know when you're up and running and you know with the regulations you know shifting you know it's going to be super important for us to plan for those changes now um, in programming and as you're planning out your facility, then waiting for, for, for it to, to, to fully, fully go, go live. Yeah. David Dixon, you painted a picture for me once, um, of what food manufacturers look for when they purchase a facility and it had to do with the cleanliness above the ceiling. Can you relate that story? That was just mind-blowing to me in the in the food industry what they would pass over what they would bulldoze that most cannabis operators are trying to squeeze a full cannabis operation into yeah i just uh i just published on uh, linkedin one of my posts and in there is a sentence that um most food facilities are bulldozed and, and owners have to go greenfield because they don't have enough vertical height to put in a decent interstitial space and in uh in Smaller renovations in the cannabis sector, particularly, what you don't want to do is pull a ladder out, open up a two by four ceiling grid panel, stick your head up, and go, "Oh my gosh!" You know, it's that uh, the, the unsanitary nature of what's above the process is very critical. So I focus on the ceiling and what we call the interstitial space above the ceiling uh, quite a bit in my discussion. Yeah, I mean, that's, that doesn't get talked about a lot. I mean, we talk, we, we're starting to touch on here in this conversation, we were touching on separation of uses, right? We were talking about the separation of uses between hort, hort spaces, cocoa coir, and um, food and food safety and sanitary design. But there's that other vertical separation of spaces between what's happening on the floor and within the room and what's happening above the ceiling. Sort of creating a mechanical mezzanine as a full separate space and you know not wanting to go up there and see you know, Dunkin' Donut coffee cups and, and dust balls and, you know, and just junk, but right, right. Seeing that as a cleanable maintenance space is a way to understand, is a whole new level of separation of uses. Um, Tony, to, you know, in separation of uses, Dario brought this up and I'm wondering from a Hort perspective, you know, um, in terms of assuring quality and ensuring uh, success, Tell us about quarantine. You know, we talk, we talk about separation of uses, right? There's a whole receiving of materials that goes on in, in a cannabis facility. There's all kinds of different materials, but hort materials and consumables uh, are, are critical. Um, give us sure. your, uh, do you have a perspective on, on the sort of receiving and processing of, of, of hort materials? Sure, that, that we, we oftentimes, we, you know, we become very familiar with a particular vendor that we like to use. And so we get comfortable with receiving products um, that arrive in the same condition, right? And so we bring products in, we hold them for a given period of time in a quarantine room, and then unexpectedly, our vendor uh, changes a manufacturer. And so now he's bringing in a cocoa core, let's say, for example, from a different vendor on his side, and he doesn't tell us about it. So we've gotten comfortable with just bringing his product straight in because we haven't had any problems. 
Now, all of a sudden, we do that with a new vendor's product, and we have too many salts that are locked up in the cocoa core, or there's some contaminants in there. And it's that complacency that we have to make sure that we design when we're doing a facility design. We have to make sure that we don't allow for that. We need to be doing our proper testing. We need to be following our protocol because eventually if you get complacent in what you do, uh, you will, you will it'll become problematic. So quarantines are very important. Uh, also on the, on the cultivation side, if you're bringing in new cultivars um, into the facility and you have a source that you've been using over and over and he has a problem on his side with pest or contamination of some kind and you bring those plants into your facility and you don't properly onboard them by watching them in the quarantine room and allowing those problems to present themselves uh, we can have some serious issues and so we want to make sure that we maintain isolation with quarantine rooms our, our process control and then and then of course making sure that we communicate with our vendors um, that they need to inform us if they're making a change on their side and we control it on our side as well yeah, if I, if David, I can just yeah, David, it. tell us, tell us, give us a, give us perspective from total quality management on vendor qualifications. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, vendor qualifications, supplier qualification, those are, you know, basic programs that you, they don't have to be super complicated, but just starting with that, right? Asking your suppliers, your vendors, you know, basic questions of, you know, are they going to, you know, do they have some sort of training program? Do they have any sort of certifications? What specifications and what do they do? Do they have a deviation program so that when things fail um, or, you know, when they change raw suppliers, do they notify you? Are they required to? Do you want to ask them to? Those are all, you know, fundamentals that you really want to ask those folks because, hey, I have known Tony and Brian for years, but all of a sudden, you know, COVID happened. Oh my God, I have supply chains all messed up. I have to find somebody new to get, you know, this certain material. Um, how does that affect you downstream? And if you're not notified, all of a sudden there's a surprise there. And, you know, the data is there from uh, to tie it to quality control. In Colorado, 12.5% of products, um, of, the, of the ag products still fail final product testing, right? That's not made up numbers. That's right from the MED's website. <clears throat> it stayed consistent despite being one of the oldest markets. So one in eight, all right, what's the cost of a failure of 12 and a half, one in eight of your products, of your batches? Could you have asked the questions up front, you know, before it gets into your production line, everything from raw materials, you know, coca coir, um, even your packaging, um, you know, is the glass inert? Is is there some sort of contamination there? Leachables of plastics when you're storing your oil in there. Those are all things that if you haven't thought through and asked those questions, um, it's a really expensive oops. So do, being preventive and proactive in nature is what's going to kind of save your butt um, once you get going. And uh, David Dixon, is there similar pieces in the in the sanitary design and food safety that um, that you could tell us about in terms of just um, product and right ingredient storage sure. and movement of materials, movement of food. You know, does the sure. does the dock or the bay that you bring it in on need to change depending on the the, the products you're manufacturing? I think the uh, to turn it into uh, food safety jargon uh, and HACCP jargon, uh, Brian uh, and Brooke, let's pull up the uh, the next survey, and then I'll I'll tie that back into HACCP. Here we go, everybody. Let's get uh, your responses into this survey. We'll give you about 15, 20 seconds. I think there's one or two folks on our call that will know what a HACCP is, but I'm it's curious a, to know. They, they, when you're in the, in the larger today, industry, so. they hear it as HAZOP, which is a different process entirely. But HACCP is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points, and that's the basis for most of food safety nowadays. Uh, it's now gone into Food Safety Modernization Act. They've changed the term to HA RPC, uh, but, uh, and there are detailed differences between the two. But in the HACCP approach um, and in the Food Safety Modernization Act approach, that ingredient coming in, you have to um, certify that supplier. You'll have to get your certificate of authenticity you have to apply what's called upstream preventative control. So that's the preventative control on an ingredient coming in. And that actually, that little detail, that little approach affects a lot about flow patterns in the facility, about uh, transfer points, uh, paperwork, of course, and procedures, uh, time, time, in the, uh, 
time in the process to allow for sampling. Uh, sampling homogenization is a huge topic, but it, the, the, the capture phrase is upstream preventative control, and that relates to the previous discussion. But uh, HACCP feeds into sanitary design generally uh, as being categorized by three things. Um, microbiological risks, physical risks, and chemical risks. So that not that difficult. Um, and then sanitary design drives you to eliminate microbiological challenges by having durable materials, no niches, ledges, traps, clean surfaces, cleanable surfaces, no cavity walls. Uh, you have to inspect and maintain. And it has to be clean throughout the entire production day. Physical is a little simpler, glass, fiberglass, paint, rust. And chemical is things that might come in on your utility, compressed air, oils, uh, chemical, officially chemicals. Um, but that's really HACCP and how HACCP drives sanitary design. And it ties back to the Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, the regulations written around 21 CFR 117, 21 CFR 111. It all kind of goes back to HACCP. Yep. Awesome. Dario, David mentioned a number of in that, you know, a lot of physical things, right? A lot of things that are that, that are architectural that need to show up in a, in a specification, right? Everything from wall material, you mentioned cavity walls, right? Um, you know, people are still building cavity walls around grow rooms, for example. I think by cavity wall, for those uninitiated, we're talking about stick built or metal studs with a cavity and some sort of wall panel on the other side. Uh, versus maybe an insulated metal panel, which is a pre-adhered metal panel to a to a, a foam core that has no opportunity for moisture migration, moisture mitigation between spaces. Um, tell us, sort of, from an architectural point of view, Dario, what um, what sort of measures uh, you go through to help build quality. So, as you mentioned, Brian, you know we look at you know everything from walls when um, walls, ceilings, and floors. So, you know, working with, you know, David and Tony or the Davids and Tony, you know, we begin to analyze, you know, what property of materials we're putting into the facility, you know. You know, moving away from, you know, stick build to IMP, you know, what quality does that have, you know? Apart from the cleanability standpoint, you know, we have an, a, a good insulation value. So from an architectural standpoint, you know, we're keeping that room tight and having that insulation value that, you know, we can maintain calm, calm and calm check with, you know, making sure yep. that, you know, he is being kept inside the room and we're not having to escape, but also looking at, you know, what other materials and processes are going on, you know, what is their cleaning processes? Can these walls keep up with how often they're cleaning the room, um, you know? Is it gonna wear away after a specific time? You know, the right. floor has a lot of movement. So, what are we specking on the floor? Is it epoxy? Is it you know seal concrete? You know, there's a million and one ways that we can um, do things, and we want to make sure that we're doing the right and selecting the right products for the facility. And that goes back to what we write in our specifications. You know, if we right. know that we want to maintain certain things in the in the facility, then we can put those in our specs early so that the contractor knows what is acceptable um, to use as a building material. And then he can go out, he can bid those out, he can get pricing back. So the client is aware of what price it is gonna come in to build these facilities. And if it's a little bit too high, you know, then we can come back and have a discussion as a team. Okay, maybe we don't use IMP, um, Throughout, throughout the entire facility, maybe certain portions can be that stick bill. But if we do do stick bill, you know, is it a, is it a fiberglass face um, jit, you know? Right. So there's other ways that we can maintain the cleanliness of what we want these rooms to be and the, the, the overall performance of these rooms. Um, but we just have to understand what the processes are so that we can make informed decisions on what materials we use. So um, just keep an eye on the clock. We're, uh, we're about 35, 38 minutes into this. I want to uh, do a, a final round of the panelists here before we open it up to Q&A. We're getting a lot of good questions in here. 
um, final round of Q and A uh, of us panelists, I'd like to dive into sort of use cases. If you want to bring up, um, if you want to touch on any of the points or this sort of build on these themes of how to build from a program through uh, to build excellence into facility design, or do you want to talk about uh, use cases that have brought into question materiality and durability or uh, separation of uses that got, got, got talked about didn't get much uh, depth here on the call. I think separation of uses is a fascinating topic between separating between, between food service uses and business uses and horticulture uses. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll kick it over to Tony and see if you want to uh, give, us a, give us a colorful story or a couple of use cases that uh, may or may not surprise the audience. Well, I, I, think, I think one of the key factors about facility design is this is a facility owned by people. This is not a facility owned by the grower necessarily. So in terms of designing a facility, we need to be thinking about how do we create and maintain a facility that can continue on from grower to grower to grower. The facility needs to be built in such a fashion so that if you make a change with a grower, you can still operate. We don't, it's, we oftentimes see growers come and go. They initially start in with an organization, they take off, and then the, the, the business people are left behind with in the middle of this process. And so choosing the right architects, choosing the right engineering group, choosing the right process engine, choosing the right facility design people is imperative in the beginning because at some point you know, the owners may rely upon them. And if they have a grower that leaves and they have a facility circled around him, uh, that could be a very serious cost impact uh, with changes in redesign. So uh, that's kind of a, a good takeaway for me. Um, I, I try to promote that a lot with people, um, just understanding that this is this is a, a facility and a business that should be treated like any other business that's out there. I mean, if you build a kitchen, you build a kitchen that will cook. Well, this is right. a production facility. So let's grow, let's build a facility that will produce. And that's what's, in, that's what's important. So thank you, Brian, I'll, I'll kick it back to you. David Valancourt, how about you? <clears throat> yeah, you know, the one thing I want to touch on there is is management commitment and the basics of planning, right? And, you know, before we jump into the, some of the questions, right, you know, most folks have not asked these questions, have not gone through these considerations. And, you know, they're you're obviously the industry is evolving and changing and growing fast. So it's hard to keep up with, you know, what you're going to be producing in three years, but just thinking about it, writing it down and saying, these are some considerations we may need to be aware of in five years. If you haven't like at least thought of that and, you know, kind of maybe just drop that casually in an email or, you know, when, with your conversations with say Brian and Dario, then they're going to have no idea that that's something they should keep on their radar because you've built dozens of facilities, you've designed them. So you've seen, you know, all right, well, if you might want to have this kind of packaging line someday, you may want to consider that. <laughs> and then to Tony's point with kind of the, you know, this isn't about just the grower. This isn't even about, you know, it's not about Tony. It's not about the CEO. It's about the objectives of the business. And you need to build that framework in place and instill that culture and ask those questions up front so that the legacy, you know, I like to say, hey, Tony, don't you want to go on vacation? Maybe you want to go to the Barbados uh, for vacation and uh, hang out with Dario. Um, who's going to do your work when you're on vacation? How have you designed this so that it's repeatable by not just the Tonys of the world? I think that's a really important thing that folks need to kind of get their egos out of the way and consider when they design and when they operate their operation, their facility. So to that, um, I'll yield the floor. Mr. Dixon. I would bring up a topic that hasn't been covered yet, and that is the link between the product and the facility design and the room design. Uh, a chocolate room or chocolate manufacturing is extremely different than gummy. Uh, things that uh, liberate steam, uh, things that don't have kill steps or the kill step, there's a lot of manipulation to the product, a lot of exposure to food risk after the kill step, which is the step that makes the food completely safe. Uh, the brownies that come out of the oven, that's a kill step, but what do you do to the brownies afterwards? Things that rely on low water activity for food safety are can be approached a little bit differently than things that have to be uh, maintained sanitary through the chill chain. So there's a lot to do with what are you gonna make and how are you gonna make it? Once we know that, let's design the facility. 
And Mr. Boyce. Well, I, I would I would say, you know, everything that everyone has said before ultimately affects, you know, what we do from an architectural standpoint, how we lay out spaces, um, how we, you know, approach the overall project. I would say to always keep in mind, you know, as cannabis becomes federally legal someday, someday soon, hopefully, um, there's going to be some additional things that you have to look out for in designing a facility that we kind of want to bake into design, you know, now, so that when it does go legal, you know, you have no problems in passing compliance with the FDA or whoever that managing body is going to be. Um, so just making sure that, you know, you, you all, all always look in to the future of where you want to go business-wise, you know, looking at where the industry is going, you always want to be that one step ahead. Um, and that is something that we can begin to factor in as we're, you know, going through programming and, you know, fleshing out design. Awesome. I'll add one uh, that occurred to me that hadn't come up here, but it has to do with indoor air quality. I know this has been a topic of conversation a lot. Indoor air quality is enormously significant for facilities uh, from a GMP perspective. If you think about uh, cascading air effects, what rooms have positive pressure, what rooms have negative pressure, how are airlocks used? Those, those, three, those three pieces can be linked together from a ventilation perspective uh, and are hugely impactful for how pathogens and airborne microbials move throughout a facility and the design. And you know, what are the doors, you know, do the doors have closers on them? Right? Do people prop the door open when they're standing, you know, having a cigarette break and they forget to close the door and that air is just blowing right down, right down a grow corridor and potentially into a grow room. So indoor air quality um, also has to do with CO2, another whole topic of discussion, uh, and also has to do with ventilation, right? Being a good neighbor. And does that, does that, does it, is there, where, how is that air deposited out into the, you know, into the Denver night, or is it deposited into a, you know, a residential neighborhood, uh, you know, in Boulder? And do the neighbors, are they on board with that? Or should there be any kind of, you know, mitigation involved? Um, whole lot of topics there for, 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 for digestion, but uh, this has been a fantastic discussion. We're right at the about 44 minute mark, um, 45 minute mark. And uh, we got some great questions coming in. I wanna- Brian, can I add one quick yeah. point to your, oh. um, you, know, you mentioned like keeping the door open while somebody's taking their cigarette break. One thing yeah. we see so often too is, um, you know, you've got, you've got this change room, you've got an air, air lock to get folks, right. to get, to, to get the per people into the operation. And then what's in the back? the wide open bay shipping and receiving door. Right, and no airlock they, between the corridor and the, and the shipping and receiving door, right? So you went through all that trouble, all that expense to just have all your risks come blowing right in the back door. Um, so right. don't forget about that, right? <laughs> Airlocks on both ends, no, that's a really good point. So egress corridors, right? From an architectural perspective, one of the basic things is a corridor cannot be over a certain length if a building doesn't have an automatic sprinkler system or it's you know a little bit shorter length if it doesn't have. So but that quarter shouldn't just end in the outside door. There should be an airlock because sometimes, so think of it as a, think of it as a sally port in a security environment where one door opens and closes before the next door opens and closes. Same thing in the transition between your, 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 your receiving bay and your quarantine room. The quarantine room should have a door that closes to the shipping bay and then opens to the horticulture corridor so that things can be pulled in and moved sequentially without just having an onrush of polluted air or, you know, whoever's driving by. Um, yeah, really important. Sweet. So um, I am going to just take these questions here and kick them over. We got a lot of thump. We got a lot of reactions to Darwin's uh, question. I get this all the time. What is the cost per square foot to design and build one of these facilities? Um, mm -hmm. I'll add to that. Did they tell you what they want in the facility or did they just ask for a price? <laughs> right? Has the customer actually defined their process before they ask? I mean, I've got probably three proposals waiting to be answered, but I don't know what's supposed to go into their building yet, right? So programming is a huge uh, part. Anybody else want to take a take a stab at this? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take a look at it. Yeah, so certainly that's one of the the challenges that we always get. You know, we have people want to get into this, and they they want to ballpark this. And and again, that the programming phase is critical to deciding 
uh, what the cost per square foot's going to be. Uh, another part of that also is you know, what are you, what kind of a building are you starting with? I mean, are you yeah. starting with a ground upper? Are you starting with a, a, a retrofit of some kind? Is it an old warehouse or is a, a you know, a wood floor warehouse or is it a concrete floor warehouse? All of those. So we try to break down the cost per square foot uh, from to two basic, well, I do at least into two day, two basic pieces. What is the cost of the structure and to upgrade that to an operating shell? And then yep. what is the retrofit of the inside of the facility? And, and those decisions for the inside are based on the programming piece. Are you going to be vertically integrated? Are you just cultivating? Are you, do you have a lab? Do you have a kitchen? Are you processing on site? Are you packaging on site? All of those questions come into that and they all lend into the actual cost per square foot. So it's a really loaded question and we appreciate right. that being brought forward and it's, it always comes up. That is the, and to give you a number, it's, it's very, very challenging to do that. I've seen it from you know, $250 a square foot up to $650 a square foot based on what the programming needs are for the facility and if you're going to well, implement GMP or not. So. Technically, I heard the question as, "What does it cost to design one of these facilities?" But it, you're, 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 it was, it's the same. It's a different order of magnitude, but it's the same questions that have yeah. to be answered in order to come up with, you know, most of us as designers and professionals, it's an hourly thing, right? So, how many hours is it going to take? Um, you know, that's and that really has to do with scope. Here's a similar one from our friend Eric Myers. Uh, can you talk about the issues related to greenfield build, which is new building on a, on that's what greenfield refers to, versus overhauling and customizing, which is tenant improvements in, within an existing structure? Uh, how would your answer change based on cannabis vertical cultivation, manufacturing, dispensary, retail? I thought David Dixon's illustration of the food industry, which would bulldoze a building before they took on something that only had three feet of available space above a ceiling, right? Because of I mean, think about that relative to this question, right? It would be better off building a new building so that your employ so that your maintenance employees could stand fully vertically on the ceiling of a grow environment before trying to retrofit a building, whether that's a grow beneath you or whether that's a kitchen beneath you, the same rules apply, right? Is that you need that operation with under your feet to be sustainable and repeatable. And so the folks who have to work on it need ample, ample space to do that. And that's that's an often ignored aspect of facility design. So I think Eric, that's buried in your in your question or maybe a little bit more than your question, but each of those pieces needs ample space. And so, you know, but we've all designed and we've all worked on facilities that don't have that ample space. Uh, I talked about it relative to, manuf to the mechanical room, right? If you don't give your mechanical installer enough room to run the duct work, you could be facing incrementally higher monthly costs uh, than your neighbor uh, because you didn't have as big of a mechanical room and it cost you more at the end of the day to operate your facility. So hugely impactful. And to add to that, Brian, you know, whether it is new build or, you know, you're using an existing structure, um, just make sure that you understand what you want to do within the facility. Um, while you're planning it out. Um, right. you know, whether it's, you know, we can oftentimes forget about something um, in the design process. So, you know, to each their own, there's gonna be issues with, with any regardless. It depends on how proper, um, how properly you, you plan and go through programming and go through the design process, how methodical you are, you know, do you have the right consultants to make sure that you are implementing the right things. Cause at the end of the day, you know, new or retrofit, if it's not properly planned out, um, then you're gonna still run into issues, you know, once you're up and running. You know, that leads us right to this Eric Gustafson's question here. Who do you think is going through this planning and creating these systems, right? Is it, or what percentage of current businesses or what size of a business would be likely? Uh, and I think the example is saying, you know, 25% is it, is it 25% or is it for pro, uh, facilities over 20 employees or over 10 million? Um, I have an answer to that. Who, 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 anyone else would want to take a stab at that? I think, um, Tony, I see your head bopping up and down. Yeah, sure. That I would say uh, for a successful, successful deployment of a business, anyone. 
Anybody. Anybody. Hundred uh, percent. And and let's think of it in terms of of um, dollar figure. If you have a one million dollar facility and you make a mistake, well, your risk exposure, you know, is reasonably low. If you're planning a fifteen to twenty five million dollar facility and you make a mistake, it can be very very costly. And so, it, the programming is the very beginning. The design criteria is the very beginning stages, and that's what we build upon. We build everything around those decisions that are made early on, and that de and that's where we can come up with a number of what it's going to cost to put a building together, what it's going to cost to design it. All of those factors come into that. But yes, I agree with you, Brian. I think everybody on the yeah. panel would agree. Anyone 100%. starting out needs to do it. How about Darwin's question here? Can you guys describe the compounding costs of facility design changes during construction drawing phase? Right. This is an argument for why would you do program programming and design criteria first? It's to avoid those compounding costs. The cost of change. Uh, there's a wonderful graph that talks about the cost of the cost of change versus the cost of money. Right. It's the they're, they're inverted they're inverted curves. I wish I had a graphic to pull it up. There's a wonderful graphic you can pull, find it online. The opportunity for change is the greatest before design has begun, right? Because there's no there's no paperwork to change. There's no construction on site, so the opportunity for change is huge, and the cost of change at that early phase is also very very low because it's conversational and it's whatnot. But as soon as the as soon as you be as soon as you're into construction. The opportunity for change is gone, and the cost of that change is enormous, right? So it pushes. It says you want to front load. FEL front um, front end loaded is a term in design that talks about doing a lot of the work up front before you build as a way of a, saving that problem. Um, uh, Darwin specifically is front end loading is is get is programming is the begin and the, the you know the, the the absolute start of a front end loaded situation. Right. And to, to add to that, Brian, also um, think of it this way, you know, with that programming document, you know, this is what everyone is designing towards. If for some strange reason you make a change, you know, it can be ever so small, you know, and it affects the floor plan, it's going to affect the engineer's work, it's going to affect everyone's work. So there's a greater amount of rework needed, which is going to cost more money. So what Brian mentioned about doing it early is the best way to go. Yep. How about here from Jordan? Is there an ideal square foot range for canopy room inside a facility? Tony, that's a hort question. Um, I'll let you try that one. Sure. Good. Good question, Jordan. I, th I think uh, there's two pieces to that. Um, you, you, you said the facility. So from facility design, we're talking about the entire shell of the building here. And so again, what are we doing in the building? Uh, are we, do we have a lab or are we just a can? Are we just cultivation? So maybe try to boil down and get what you're meaning here is what is the ideal range of canopy inside of a cultivation facility where it's, they're just cultivating um, within a space. I would say, you know, from a total canopy, if you, uh, you maybe 65% of the entire facility might be canopy on a single tier. If you go with a two tier system, you could easily be, be up in, you know, 85% of the total square footage of the space because of the way that canopy is calculated in, in multiple states. A three tier, well, now we're really talking a big number. Um, but generally speaking, if you can get 65% or so of your square footage in a facility just for full uh, cultivating and not having a lab or a kitchen or anything else in there, just basic processing, I think you would be in, in a really, really good shape there. Tony, Tony, let me ask you a nuance to that. So room size, I've seen a lot of different growers take different attitudes about room size. You're absolutely right. It's, it's a percentage of your gross facility. But what is integrated pest management? I know different states have different allowances for pest mitigation. Does room size play a role in your, uh, in how, in the quality of your crop and in the consistency of your crop? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest failings that we have as an industry, and I think David Valencourt touched on it, you know, brilliantly early, uh, talking about the, the number of failures that we have for contaminations and pests across the country. Uh, it's very important. Uh, integrated pest management is very important and a way that we can help facilitate uh, 
better control practices is designing a room that doesn't have a lot of extra space, right? We don't want to have extra lot of floor space in the room. We don't want to have types of walls uh, where things can, you know, contaminants can settle on and, and build and grow and biofilm and all of these other nasty contaminations that are out there, right? That's part of the design piece. So absolutely integrated IPM is so very important. Um, uh, even in facility design, we, we take that in consideration. Awesome. And then one last uh, thing to add oh, on yeah, that, go, Brian, go which is oftentimes missed is, you know, you know, overall size of the room, but you also have to look at egress. So, you know, the architect would look at, you know, the, the ideal size of the room, look at it from an egress standpoint to see whether you need one or two doors um, to get out of that room. And if you do need a second door, where's that second door going? Ideally, right. it's another corridor and not the outside wall. So something to factor in when you're looking at the size of your can or your flower rooms, your canopy rooms is the overall footprint and the distance that is needed to get to that door, to that egress right. door. Don't forget about the building code. Don't forget about the fire code. Uh, it's right. You got to balance. You got to balance life safety along with plant safety. Oh, great point. Uh, Darwin asks. I noticed occupational and environmental health. I guess OSHA, right? Uh, design considerations were not addressed. Good point. Can you quickly describe the importance of properly addressing hazards in the design of a facility? Um, I know that there's, uh, in addition to OSHA, there's also, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, there's NOISH, N-O-I-S-H, which is, you know, governs agricultural workers and how much weight an individual can lift over their head, think bushels of apples, right, in any given day. So tiered grows would, uh, would start to get into questions of occupational safety, um, absolutely. Um, Dave Valancourt, do you want to? Yeah, I can. <laughs> Yeah, I know we're at time, so I'll just quickly tie in here and say, you know, that's, we didn't address it, but that's a critical consideration from employee health and wellness, uh, legal considerations, and, you know, yeah, we don't have a seat on the table here today, unfortunately, for that, but, you know, I've got my colleague, Laura Davis, and there's plenty of, you know, EPA, OSHA experts that really need to be part of that process, too. You know, how much are you manually, and that considers, you know, manual versus automation, too. Are you manually filling things? Or are you manually picking up and dumping, you know, large large weights of, you know, batches of harvested product into your extraction, how are you going to do that? And what are the CO2 canisters, there? Right? Don't schlep CO2 canisters around your facility on little, you know, hand <laughs> truck, get a, get a delivery company, an exterior tank and deliver it right into your, into your ventilation system saves on, on worker, worker injury and back problems. We have hit our mark. Uh, we've got, I think there was one remaining dangling question we didn't get to. I hope, uh, I hope you are uh, satisfied nonetheless. Um, and I will hand it over to Brian Gilbert to, uh, to walk us out. But thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, this, was, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate your time. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Brian, for moderating such an engaging and thought-provoking question. I really or panel. I really appreciate appreciated all of the engagement with the Q and A segment in particular amongst our audience members. So, thank you all so much for posting such great questions, which allowed the panel to bring the conversation where you all wanted it to go. Um, so, again, as always, we will be um, creating a PDF of today's slide deck specifically sharing the contact information slide with all of our participants post-broadcast. Um, I know a lot of people are exchanging information via the chat room right now, so uh, please do stick around for the next few minutes. Uh, this will be your opportunity to come up to the front of the room and have those one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with the panelists uh, over the next few minutes while we're um, closing out today's program. So our uh, virtual or our panel is going to leave the virtual stage per se. Um, let's give them a virtual round of applause. Raise your hand inside the audience pool. Fantastic. I always love seeing that uh, positive engagement from the audience. Um, and as always, we're going to close out today's program by giving you a quick preview of some upcoming uh, events, virtual and in-person, that we all would love your participation in um, underneath the NCIA umbrella. So thank you all once again to NCIA's Facility Design Committee, Dario, David, Tony, David, and Brian uh, for presenting today's fantastic panel discussion. All right, perfect. So tomorrow we'll be broadcasting this month's members only fireside chat with NCIA's government relations team program entitled Looking to the North, Lessons Learned from Canada. 
In 2018, Canada became the second country in the world to formally legalize the cultivation, possession, acquisition, and consumption of cannabis and its byproducts. While shifting political dynamics, successful ballot initiatives, and the entrepreneurial drive of American small businesses may have started the regulated global cannabis market, the U.S. is quickly falling behind as, it, as those markets expand internationally. Tomorrow, you'll be able to join Mike and Michelle and their guests this month from High Tide, Diplomat Consulting, Thrive Cannabis, and Materia Ventures as they take a deep dive into the, into the lesson learns from Canada, including ways to reform laws, spotting red flags, and crafting regulations. As with all of our Industry Essentials educational webinars, this session is free for only current NCIA members. Um, however, if you're one of the non-members that are that is attending today's session, feel free to follow the short link here that uh, we have posted. I believe our colleagues are going to post it in the chat room as well. Um, and uh, in order to claim a, an exclusive opportunity to participate in this monthly members-only program. And then additionally, we currently have over six webinars scheduled between now and the end of April, which are all free for current NCIA members. So if you are one of those non-members participating today, please activate your membership now to gain access to this and all of the other amazing benefits offered. Or you can continue to purchase those non-member pass to continue engaging with all this invaluable programming prior to taking that plunge on an annual commitment. And with that, thank you all so much for participating in another NCIA Industry Essentials educational webinar. Huge thank you once again to the members of our facility design committee for presenting today's session along with our audience members and member businesses, which make our work possible each and every day. Uh, you'll all be redirected to a short attendee survey after we close the meeting room. Please do complete that to provide us some really invaluable feedback to improve these future programs. And then stay on the lookout for us to post a formatted recording of today's uh, session first inside of our members only community platform, NCIA Connect. It will live there over a 30 day period providing exclusive member only access to the session. And then we will host a public premiere uh, later next month, debuting the session to the public at large. Um, as always, we'll leave you all with this end of event credit sequence, highlighting the 30 plus member businesses that make up the facility design committee, as well as all those that participated in today's session. Um, we'll be featuring some lo-fi audio stylings by yours truly. Stick around for the next few minutes, interact with each other in the chat room. Um, and if you don't see your member business uh, highlighted, then that means that you need to go to the cannabisindustry.org slash join. Uh, to join the movement for a responsible and equitable cannabis industry. Enjoy, and uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow afternoon for our monthly members-only session uh, with Mike and Michelle from our GR team. We'll see you then.